Australia, the largest island in the world, with a coastline washed by three oceans and the Timor Sea. Land of vast distances, held by only seven million people. 12,000 miles of coastline, much of it sparsely populated, to be guarded day and night against the menace of enemy invasion. A giant problem of defence. Sea lanes to be swept clear of mines. Traffic routes far from our shores to be kept open. Shipping to be convoyed against the ever-present threat of enemy raiders. Raiders themselves to be tracked down in vast expanses of trackless ocean which presents the old problem of the needle in the haystack. What a gigantic job confronts the Royal Australian Navy. The manhood of this young and virile British people has from earliest childhood had the love of the sea deep in its consciousness. The Cooks and Phillips who swept over wide uncharted oceans in tiny cockleshell craft to make Australia forever British were worthy descendants of the sea dogs of England who scattered the great armada. And in the hearts of the men of the Royal Australian Navy, fighting the greatest war in the history of the world, their gallant, dauntless spirit lives on. From all over Australia, young men are travelling to join the crew of the HMAS Cerebus, the ship that never goes to sea. Any day now, the German Admiralty may be expected to announce they've sunk her. HMAS Cerebus is the Navy's name for Flinders Naval Depot, where youth is trained to take its place in Australia's young fleet. A fleet barely 30 years old, but already rich in tradition, with the stars of many victories emblazoned on its battle flag. The Emden, Bartolomeo Colleone, the North Sea, the Mediterranean, and victories yet to come. Boats heavy, boots light, shoes gymnastic, shoes white canvas, one collar blue jeans, brush shaving, brush blacking, brush polishing, brush clothes, brush hair, brush too. They haven't overlooked a thing. It's a way they have in the Navy. And there's the bugle. From now on, it governs their lives. It's the bugle to get up. Goodbye to feather beds. <sighs> the bugle to eat. And how they eat. And the bugle to work. Discipline. The underlying keynote of all their training. But it's a democratic discipline that the men understand and appreciate. No matter what branch of the Navy they join, their first training is in seamanship. They join the Navy to see the world. And what will they see? Well, they'll see the sea. And they're glad of it. In cutters and whalers, the veriest landlubber soon feels he's the ancient mariner himself. The naval recruit's first command is in the classroom on a model bridge that swings round in answer to the wheel. The helmsman alters course by the compass in front of him, while the other two lads signal down messages to an imaginary engine room. First, the boys put in a lot of time on the quarter deck, the parade ground to you and I. With regular hours, plenty of solid, interesting work, regular exercise and good food, they begin to take on the muscle and solid flesh that makes them the kind of huskies sailors always are. Fighting men in the making. There can be no fear for the future of our nation while we have men like these. Thorough grounding in seamanship, the youngsters go forward to specialised study of the particular department of the Navy they've chosen to follow, signal school. Signallers are the nervous system of the Navy, passing messages from the control centre throughout the ship, in fact to the entire fleet and to bases on shore. At sea, signals between ships are given by flags, heliograph or lights, as wireless might betray their position to the enemy. The same system was used in Nelson's day, and the results are just as satisfactory. A model representing warships in line of battle. From the masthead of the flagship ahead flashes an order, and this is passed down the line with incredible rapidity. The recruits are carrying out a similar exercise on the parade ground. Each man represents a ship, and they manoeuvre to shouted signals. These boys reckon that theirs is easily the most interesting job in the Navy. A class of budding engineers. They must know every secret of the giant boilers and turbines, of their working and upkeep, 
And in case the enemy gets in a lucky hit, they must be ready to make running repairs in battle. They'll all tell you they've got the best job in the Navy. The Torpedo School. Worth a couple of thousand pounds apiece, these tin fish. British torpedoes travel further than those of any other country. The course a torpedo is to take is set before they're fired. If heavy seas or currents deflect them from their deadly task, the gyroscopically controlled rudders immediately steer them back to their course again. What wouldn't Hitler give to know what's in this box of tricks? Of course, any torpedo man will tell you his job is absolutely tops in the Navy. But in the gunnery school, they haven't any doubt as to who has the most of Gunners, of course. Perhaps you've sometimes wondered how a fast-moving battleship in a heavy sea can score a direct hit on another fast-moving ship miles off. Well, this is where they teach the answer to that question. Allowance must be made for the roll and pitch of the ship, the speed of the enemy, the course of both ships, atmospheric pressure, and a dozen other things. The answer to this simple sum must be found in a split second, for by the time the guns are fired, the enemy will have moved to some other place. Way up above the ship is the control tower. Through the two telescopic sights projecting on either side, the operator sees a double image of the target. He focuses until the two images merge, and the range can then be read on the dial. Up in the control tower, they must also predict the change in position of the enemy during the time the shells will be travelling through the air. All the corrections are continually being passed to the central control, way down below the waterline. Here is the fighting brain of the whole ship. Down there, delicate and intricate apparatus digests all the factors continually passed in gives one main correction, which is passed on to the gun. But keeping the guns on the target isn't easy with the ship rolling and pitching. The gun layer keeps the gun trained in a vertical field. And the trainer in a horizontal field. They've got to be on the target all the time, as all guns are fired simultaneously in a salvo from the central control tower. The rolling platform in the classroom gives them all the movement they'll experience at sea. Newcomers even get seasick. There's realism for you. The trainees are using air guns and getting good results. Air attack complicates the gunner's job. As the trainees can't fire on the target plane, they shoot photographs instead of shells. If the plane is in the picture, it's a hit. If it's not, well, the instructor wants to know why. There's only one kind of miss that interests the Navy. All the time, Flinders is sending out fit fully trained men to serve in the ships of our growing fleet. Every man among them waiting for the great day when his months of specialized training can be put into practice. The day that his ship sounds action stations in deadly earnest. Enemy sighted. This is what they've been waiting for. Action stations. Speed ahead. If it's the Italian Navy, they'll be on the run, and the bridge will demand every ounce of speed the turbines can give. Man the pom-poms. Man the six-inch gun turrets. Man the torpedo tubes. Man the four-inch gun. Up goes the spotter plane to radio back to the ship the progress of the battle, the fall of her own shells. All bulkhead doors are closed. If the ship is holed below the waterline, only one compartment will be flooded, and she'll still be able to fight on. In a thousand years of naval history, no British ship ever ceased to fight while she had anything left to fight with. Between deck parties are ready to fight fires, to make running repairs. The guns are on their target. Open fire! And another enemy ship goes down before the guns of the Royal Australian Navy. 
Enemy aircraft attacking. Well, let them come. The boys in blue are ready. Aye, ready. Now they know the value of those months of training. Now that discipline that irked a bit at first is proving its worth in keen, well-controlled minds and able bodies. The bulldog breed. With the courage and tenacity with which their forefathers built a nation from a wilderness, they'll fight for their magnificent heritage. The vital spirit of Drake and Nelson flames anew as democracy faces the crucial test. Australia's sons of the sea will not fail her. For Flinders Naval Depot sends them forth, fully trained, fully equipped, to fight the age-old fight for freedom. In the classrooms and workshops of Flinders, tomorrow's victories are being won today.